Culminators, we're going to be talking today to Melissa McKenzie, who is the publisher of The American Spectator, one of the most important, if not the most important, formative influences on the young Ron Coleman. I don't know, and, and, and Melissa, I went in July, I went to Freedom Fest, and I, I got to meet Ben Stein for the first time who I was introduced to through the American Spectator at the very end of the 70s or the very beginning of the 80s, and who had so much influence on me, both as a writer and as, you know, in terms of looking a way of looking at the world. And then this week, I, I, was, on his, I was on his podcast. I was on his mm -hmm. show with Chris Ruby. He is, he is something else. What's the story? Where do you where, where do you and I is is it just from the days of blogging? You used to have your own blog. Yeah, I had my you know uh, seventeen years ago now, eighteen. I was on maternity leave. I started to I was going to do this um, health and lifestyle blog, and um, because I'm also a mommy blog. Pardon. That would have been a mommy blog. Well, actually, I was going to oh, do... No, because, you, uh, because you're a chiropractor, right? You're a chiropractor? That's right. Mm -hmm. So that's and more so than a mommy I was gonna, blog. Yeah, I was going to do a blog about that. And then um, my old interest came back and entered. I started linking to Glenn Reynolds and Instapartment and he linked me. And one thing led to another. And um, so I've been doing this a long time now. And, yeah, well, so, so, that, so that was definitely who introduced me to you, not to you personally. You and I, years later, sort of did stuff together personally. But um, yeah, you, you, you had the, what was the blog called? Was it just your name? It was um, Information Pollination. Boy. Which I'm embarrassed to what? say right now. It's like it's like a, a movie star talking about the commercials they did for right. you know Nestle Toll House cookies or something. <laughs> Do you remember remember blog rolls? It was a really big deal to get yes, on yes. Glenn Reynolds's blog roll, right? Because then you yes. then you already had juice. Just every time someone went to his page, mm -hmm. you know. And now you're with the American Spectator. You've actually paper. Is is there a paper version of that spec? Yeah. Yes, we have a magazine right now. We're moving towards a quarterly, and the reason why we're doing that is this is my just my my. I'm going to test this thesis out with you, Ron. You've been in this game for a while, so I'm going to test this out. So my my thesis is is that the weekly or even monthly magazines are rendered redundant because of the quickness of the web world and responsiveness. And so my thought, but the problem is, is that things get so lost in time that we forget when things happened, what the big stories were, what the important ideas that were being covered at the time. So my goal for the American Spectator is that our magazine captures in a comprehensive way the political, social, cultural uh, world and moment so that we, when, and that we keep these magazines, that they're beautiful and rather than just being kind of something to throw away, that the art is beautiful, that everything is something that you want to keep and then you have a way to anchor yourself in time. That's our goal. That is an ambitious goal because so few people do look back. You know, I have on my old, I call it old, and I keep calling it semi-retired, but then I think of something to put up there every couple of months, the likely to confusion blog, where I, you know, where where I have my trademark and free speech thoughts. I I plugged in an app called Old Post, um, Old Post something. And it, depending on the frequency that you pick, it recycles old posts because I realized there's stuff that I wrote on here in 2008, 2010, 
that's really good. It hasn't changed. The analysis is, and why should the fact, you know, blog, they all, blogs kind of introduced this idea of this time sensitivity. Of course, it was the internet. So what's a blog, a web log every day? What are my thoughts today? Or what's my experience today? But as you point out, you really can't get any kind of perspective just, and this is, this is the problem with our news cycle now, right? I, I've been listening to, so, so you and I recording this two days after the raid, it was a raid, on Mar-a-Lago. And one of the, what, it's already the, the, the usual suspects on the, in the writer's sphere are screaming, why does anyone do anything? Why aren't people, why, blah, blah, blah. I do think it's irrational. Like, why would anyone want to stick his neck out there? This is really not a question about American Spectator at, at all, but the news stuff, the news cycle. Why stick your neck out there when you only, all you have to do is wait three hours at this point to find out what the hell's in that, you know, what was the the, the, the premise of granting that uh, that warrant? I mean, because again, by the time people listen to this, all these questions will have been answered. But people, re I mean, we've even conservatives, of course, a lot of the conservatives are very young people, but we've we've lost patience. Yeah. Well, the thing is, we... in this case, though, I think that that even that there's a, re a reflective response even from the conservative commentator, conservative commentators who would be more judicious because. Now, like my, my irritation right now, I don't know how you feel about this, is the never Trumper people so credibly, uh, oh, you know, anything that is said by the FBI is God's honest truth. We it's, just trust at them. What, yeah. At what point do they cross that line where they stop accepting the F Like, why are you, are you deferring at all? Why give any credibility to those people at all? Right. So, so that's my irritation. I think we're seeing a lot of people jumping out uh, uh, with us because there's this reflective acceptance. The lie gets out for a week. By that time, the general public has, all they've heard is the lie. They believe the lie. And then, so the, you know, the conservative commentators reflectively defend the president, whether we know what's going on or not, um, because the, um, lies are already, you know, perpetuated. So everybody can end up being wrong, and it's just right. a ma mask of dis or misinformation flying around. And you, I, you know, and it's interesting, kind of talking, to, talking, juxtaposing that discussion with the American Spectator because. Well, before you were involved with the American Spectator, the American Spectator made a big boo boo. Mm -hmm. This was during the Clinton administration, and it had to, it, it got sued. American Spectator changed, changed ownership. This is years ago, changed management. I don't really under, is Jim Terrell sort of a, um, is, is, is he involved at all in the day-to-day -day anymore? Is he sort of an emeritus Aaron figure? Aaron Terrell is the editor-in-chief. And you know, basically, founder of the American Spectator, and he still comes into the office every week. And yeah, and I said Jim. Why did I say Jim? Why did I say Jim? Who am I thinking of? I don't know, but Emmett, it, R. He, Emmett Terrell. Yes, I grew up yes. with him. Please. Yeah, he so, also uh, boy, the the effect that he had on my writing is is mind boggling. And he's, and he's still involved. He still has, he's still so involved. So he has the yeah. institutional memory, um, you know, and obviously, I, you know, d d does that ever come up? Does that, is that ever an issue anymore? Those, those again, just to, I guess I really should acquaint um, listeners with what I'm talking about. Or do you want to give a thumbnail of, of what the story was? Well, I'm not sure which, there's been a lot of, Aram and Terrell stories. I'm not sure where you're actually going with this. This was the um, the drug running story that they had to, uh, you know, that they that they that they got sued over by the guy, the guy who had um. Uh, someone claimed that there was an that there was an airport. His cheat. The, he is cheating the Arkansas project. 
Yeah, the Arkansas project. Yeah. Yeah. So that well, the was, thing uh... is, is that there, let's put this in context, Ron. So before before that story came out, um, people have to remember that when Bill Clinton um, came into office, the media was, as they are now, completely protective. And so I wrote an article probably, it might be a year now, but it's called, I called it the blue dress proof, that the media um, won't basically publish any negative story on, say, a Democrat, unless you actually have the semen and DNA to prove it. Whereas any kind of whimsical, um, faintly, um, uh, yes, there we go, blue dress proof. Uh, you know, what it takes for the media to believe a Democrat did something wrong, conversely what it takes for a Republican to do something wrong is just innuendo. Okay, so here we have, back at this time, um, Bill Clinton was corrupt and there was very few people saying anything. Finally, Drudge, um, you know, broke the story, but it had been bubbling there. Just like Drudge now. Was all of Judge was the equivalent of all of Twitter in, these, those, in those days. He yes, was independent. Exactly. He was on the internet. There was no editor. There was no real filter. Yeah. And that's where you went to find out what perhaps the Times wasn't telling you. Exactly. So during this time, um, uh, there were lots of this articles real. being written about um, Bill Clinton. And, um, but not in the mainstream media. And so at the American Spectator, a lot was being broken. So the, the biggest story that was being broken was what they were using their um, secret service detail in Arkansas to do for them. And well, and what Bill was doing, you know, basically going to get hookers and stuff. I mean, crazy crap, right? And um, this was like having Hunter as president. Just right, not, exactly. not with the drugs so much, but in terms of the bad behavior. Right. And so like, um, we were reporting it and uh, no one else really was and it blew up. So this story broke with American Spectator. Now, one thing that you may not know is at the time, that I don't know. Um, Andrew Cuomo was at the Department of Justice as an attorney and sent, <laughs> sent a letter to the American Spectator because we were talking about his nefarious deeds um, around the same time. The FBI, uh, and so they sent a letter to R. M. Corral saying, he, he sent a letter saying he's gonna sue us and blah, blah. And our, our attorneys told him to pound sand. R. M. Corral was also investigated by the FBI. The Clintons used the FBI to investigate him. He was, um, deposed, he was the grand jury, the whole schmeal. The, what they're doing right now with Trump has been done before. They, they use this, the uh, Democrats have used every arm of the government against conservatives, and it's happened multiple times at the American Spectator. Now, that's what happened, and then we get to further this into is, this. This is, worth so, a pod, this is worth a podcast episode in and of itself. Now, were you involved with the American Spectator? At all those days? No. No, I was not. Now, yeah, like I you, I I, your I'm, a Reg, I'm a Reagan baby, right? And I'm one of those weird people who was interested in politics far too young. I listened to Rush <laughs> yeah. um, right, right from the beginning. I lived in California at the time. I listened to Rush. I, as someone as a birthday present got me a subscription to the American Spectator. So it was a dream for me when... They um, asked me to help consult with them is how I got associated with it. Cause I was doing consulting with like, I did public relations. I started with Andrew Breitbart and he called me up and asked me to help him. And then from one thing led to another and all of a sudden I'm doing this work that I had no training for, but found myself doing. And then um, various people hired me in the movement to help them with either issue advocacy or, um, you know, everything from, you know, 
uh, social media training, their journalists, I, all kinds of stuff. I, I was doing all kinds of things that are strange and whatever. And so the American Spectator <laughs> asked me to come on as a consultant. So this was about about when? When did this happen? It was when six been, years ago. With it? Six yeah, years okay. ago or so. And um, the American Spectator, as it has been its historical um, want to do, um, and rightly media organizations, after the, that, that story issue that you're talking about where the American Spectator got over their skis. And what happened was, is we had, we had a donor and some writers who were completely obsessed about the Clinton. And then, of course, you have sources making up stuff at a certain point, you know, like trying to, you know, give you stories. And you have to always be very careful about that as a journalist to make sure that you're not being played by the sources, right? And so there was some of that that was happening. And um, that kind of blew up and caused problems and yada, yada. Um, and then, so, so the American Spectator has gone through waves, I would say, of... Sure. I remember, I remember the yeah. George Gilder era. Yeah. It was so confusing. It was, what is this? What is... <laughs> and it, it seemed as if he was writing the whole magazine himself. It was so confusing. Well, so in the George Gilder era, what happened is uh, Gilder bought the magazine. And I have great respect for the man, actually, because some of the what he's oh, I do has also. been extraordinarily prescient. And so... He, so he bought the magazine and they promptly went bankrupt. And so Vladi Plajinsky, who's the um, executive editor of the American Spectator, he yeah, um, yeah, sure. kept the, started a website called The Prowler and kept things going and was actually one of the first magazines online to have, we, the American Spectator had a website before, like NR had a website before, a lot of our competitors had websites. And it was of necessity because um, the magazine had been sold and then they went promptly bankrupt and then Gilder sold it back to uh, um, Bob, R. M. Terrell Jr. for a dollar. And um, so like Newsweek, the American Spectator was once sold for a dollar. Um, and so now we're here we are. So when I came on seven, six, seven years ago, once again, we were in bad financial straits, and um, my job was to help them get back on their feet. And now we're in good. Now we're fine. But it's it, I was really? I turned That's it around. Yes. So it was a team effort, and we're in a good position now. We've got a great board. We are normal, functioning, healthy media organization. And knock on wood. We'll do, you have, do you have a podcast network? Do you have a podcast network? Let's make a we, podcast network. A podcast? Well, see, the thing is, I had that beforehand, Ron. I, you remember Liberty Pundits way back? I, yeah, we were, yeah. We were the first. We aggregated all the um, podcasts on the right. And I was actually had probably the first podcast, one of the first podcasts on the right of anybody. And this was back, I mean, now we're back in the day and um, now everybody does it. And so like, I have been literally. kind of in bit, <laughs> pardon? It seems literally yeah. just well, about everyone. So like I have been kind of ambivalent because there's so much noise in the market, whether or not um, having another one would be useful or not. But our readers, we've been working, talking about it. And one of our um, writers, is Scott McKay, who I'm sure you know, he's the, um, he has the hayride um, in Louisiana. So he's, but he also does national politics for us. And um, he's, he's written a new book called the um, Revivalist Manifesto. And basically it's how can the conservative movement revive and become what it once was and rejuvenate and go forward because there's a lot of that's the hard that, question that's, that's exactly the hard question the big... I mean, everyone knows what's wrong right yeah but and i've had this discussion with, with with yeah okay good yeah and, so and, i would highly okay, recommend so, people to read that book actually because he's talking revivalist about revivalist manifesto yeah revivalist manifesto scott mckay 
and um, he's fantastic. And he's he's got a second book coming out, so he kind of describes part of the problem. I don't know if you've noticed this. I'm going to sound like an old lady right here. Um, is that a lot of the younger people in the movement don't really um, know the history of the conservative movement, and and we have to remember. I mean, Reagan was a long, long time ago to this younger generation. And so they don't even remember pre, uh, you know, pre Reagan, you know, so like we're, we're, there's a lot of kind of institutional historical knowledge that is not Including, there. Think about the whole history of national review. Yeah. You know, William F. Buckley leaves the, the American Mercury because it's anti-Semitic, starts the National Review. He's already famous because of a God man at Yale. He's mm -hmm. this, and just the whole Buckley era of conservatism. Mm -hmm. And and then he hands at the end, you know, towards the end of his life, hands it over of all people to, to Jonah Goldberg. Mm -hmm. And we, 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 the rest is history. Mm -hmm. That of a, of a, of a kind. Mm -hmm. You're right. And, and, and what do you think, what would be the benefit to, to a millennial or, you know, these younger activists, the folks who are, I mean, I imagine people who are really at the leading edge, I'd like to think, you know, at turning point and whatnot, they, they must have some insight into this. But if, if, if more young conservatives knew more about the history of the conservative move, the post-war history of conservatism in America, what what do you think would that what would be the effect on going forward? How would that help? What would what would that do for us? Well, I you know one to be aware of not so we don't repeat history and make similar mistakes to learn something, and also to um, put the current moment in context. You know, the history didn't just begin bit, yeah. right now. And a lot, uh, you know, a lot of what we're seeing in the government, you know, a lot of this kind of political retribution type of um, thing, this pendulum swinging that we're seeing started as little waves, you know, two, you know, generations ago, predating even like national, you know, we've been around the American Spectator has been around for, um, we're gonna have our gala, our 55th, 54th gala this year. Um, oh. We are a couple years younger than National Review. We're talking a 60 year history here. There is, you know, um, there are, there was history that predated even Buckley that cr has helped create the moment that we're in now. And so that's the, alter the alternative, the alternative. Yes. Too many creative types for submitting, um, we're, we're su submitting manuscripts. Right. So here's the thing, like, I think, so on the other hand, I think it's time to move forward. Like I, I, I we are not in Reagan's time. Our times demand something different than we had and we're not we're not in a pre Reaganite time either, where where we we have the luxury. I think Bush one made this mistake, where this kind of noblesse oblige type of crusty old Republicans and we'll take care of the little people. No, that time has passed as well. We have we have the size and scope of the federal government is so massive, in compared to compared to the average citizen now in a way that simply did not exist at Re in Reagan's time. And so the problems that we are facing demand different solutions. And um, demand, um, one of the biggest key things that I think is different, is different is it's clear to me that the American people, I'm, you know, conservative libertarian, but the American people are not. And so my thing is, is that if we're going to have and Donald Trump is not, and he's That's not, right? But neither was McCain, neither was Romney, neither was Bush. They are all big government Republicans. So I, part of my problems with guys like Jonah Goldberg 
who, you know, are constantly, you know, bitching about the way, you know, Trump and everything is that we've had big government. I had to hold my nose to vote for Bush, Romney, and McCain, okay? They're big government Republicans. I didn't think they were socially conservative. And in fact, they are not socially conservative. And so what did they exactly have for me? They're not economically conservative and they're not socially conservative. So that they, they represented this kind of centrist kind of big government, but we're not as big and the way we do it is not as bad as the Democrats. Well, I find that repugnant, but I am in the minority, okay? That kind of government is not happening. And so then the question becomes, if we are going to have a bigger government, how are we going to use it? And now this is where I have a real problem with the never Trumpers, because the way they want to use the government is not any different, really, except for in slight degrees than the Democrats. And I'm getting off that train. I'm not the one who changed. You did. Or you lied. And and made and presented yourself as something you weren't. And so, um, you know, now what do we do going forward? How do we, what do we do? Well, my, my thesis is, it's not good enough to stand us for history and yell stop. No. Obviously yeah. not. Obviously it's not good enough because it didn't stop. It didn't, we, are, we have nearly one foot in the end, end zone. We're about to give the opposition a you know, a two point conversion because of what, you know, whatever, um, my football analogy is, you know, failing here as, as we are getting, and we're good, we're about to give the other team a touchdown and we're talking about stopping. They've won the game. They've won. They've won every institution. They've won every, um, uh, argument over ideas. The, this whole so-called, you know, cultural slippery slope, the fallacy, it's not a fallacy. It's, it's, it's a prophecy. And so here we are, it takes, we are going to have to use the power of the government <laughs> to, to push back and actively um, stop and change the direction of the country. So you're, you're adopting this, this sort of, um, it seems to me, uh, Michael Knowles type of approach, which is that it's not an it's it's not enough to be neutral. There's no such thing as neutrality. There are moral and political implications to every decision made and every decision that's not made. And and, and which is which which is the tragedy of liberalism. I'm sorry, which is the tragedy of libertarianism of the last generation. I'm too principal. I mean. It, here's the what's the dilemma, right? I'm too principled to vote for the GOP candidate. I'm going to therefore vote for the libertarian candidate, meaning I'm not going to vote. But if I do vote for the for the Republican candidate, I get Romney. I get McCain. Well, mm -hmm. we didn't get him anyway. We didn't get him anyway. But they certainly weren't going to vote for Trump. But you say the structures are there. We got to put our people in. And we've got to use it sort of, in other words, what the federal society has done so successfully in mm -hmm. the judiciary. Yes. Um, do the same thing in the bureaucracy. So, I mean, do you have a, you know, I, a lot of people are fairly recently have begun to explain or to publish things that put a little bit more of a finer understanding of why the deep state is so intractable. I mean, how difficult it actually is for a chief executive to fire anyone in the federal government. It's almost impossible. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, you know, I remember years ago, and I, this might've even been an article in the American Spectator when I, you know, who knows? Someone said, all the agencies have to be moved out of Washington and they gotta be spread around the country to where re real people live. And, and first, you know, th this story, you cut the legs out from the permanent state. It was not a terminology that was used at the time. But also, people they get out of the you know they get out of the, this bubble of being in Washington and being you know in this revolving door kind of thing. I mean, that strikes me as something you actually could do if you had Congress and the executive. You know, I mean, they could just pass a bill that says the Department of you know 
name it, uh, our agriculture energy. is going to be where it's going to be with or energy. It's going to be in Texas and the Department of Agriculture is going to be in Iowa. I mean, like where the stuff grows and where the stuff gets pumped out. But I'm, I'm just throwing stuff out there. But so but, but about characterizing your your thinking on this correctly? Or you well, well I, you know, I have given thought to, you know, like moving agencies to, you know, the heartland or whatever. But I, I don't think that's wise. And I'll tell you why. I've thought about it for quite a bit. The, right now, um, the federal government is a cancer on the body of the American society. It is now malignant. And it wasn't always. It was any form of government is kind of a tumor. Unless God is in charge, you know, Israel rejected that a long time ago. And humans, as time has gone on, have, have done exactly what Israel has done and picked humans to rule them. The more humans that rule you, the more suffering there is, okay? So now in the federal government, since, you know, humans, including Americans, reject God, we get the state. And so the state has grown. And it, so it's always been kind of a tumor. You know, you read Mark Twain talking about the government and you're like, you know, that was actually a time when it wasn't so bad. And it's always been bad because it's always been human. So like, but now it's not just a tumor. Now it is malignant and it's grown. We move these agencies through the heartland and through the country, it metastasizes. It's just like us trying to go to China and change, and have that economic openness. And we thought maybe that economic openness would help change their culture. No, we've been changed. And this is what would happen if we tried to bring the, if brought the federal government into the heartland, we would be changed. It's inevitable because it's a cancer. And so we have to treat it like such. And, and maybe I'm making this analogy because of my medical background, but you try, you have to keep, it's much, much easier to excise a, an encapsulated tumor than it is to excise a metastasized cancer. Sure, of course, yeah. Okay, right. and so like my thing is- That's, that's Washington, a fascinating insight. So in Washington, D.C., yeah, it's grown, it's hideous, and it's, <laughs> It's destructive, but we need to be cutting the tumor back there. So originally, the, the, the main way, way you do this is through funding. This is why it is an absolute abomination that we had 12 senators vote for that $760 billion bill. Because you mean they, 12 Republicans? Yeah, Republicans, right. the, Democrat, right. the Democrats, of course, I'm sorry, the Republicans, they have voted to increase the size and scope of government, okay? So in order for the executive branch to have anything to do with this, and this is one of my concerns about Trump being president again, is they have made it so toxic for anybody to work for him that can he get enough people to pepper through the federal government to even affect any sort of change. He's only gonna have four years to do it. We've already seen what four years is like. It's not enough time. And you're right, the government is just big and unwieldy. So you need people to come into certain agencies and sit there like a Buddha and say, no, um, so, yes, we have this funding, but no. And you know how the funding works, out in, where they have the baseline from the year before, and then, well, our budget's only increased a percent or two. Well, it was a big bloated pig a year ago, and now it's just, you know, it can't even walk. It's, and so we're adding more budget every year. And, of course, the budget being a sort of a relative concept. I mean, we have the federal government no longer operates on a budgetary basis. And Trump folded many times on continuing yep. resolutions. Yep. And those those were those were golden opportunities to really transform things. Hey, guess what? 
what would you? I would sure hate if the press got angry at me. I would should be awful if, you know, if the Democrats screamed at me. Guess what? They're going to scream at you and they hate you anyway. Right. The, the, you know that. Yeah. So you recommend that we read this book. What is it? The rent? It wasn't the, the, the revival. The revivalist manifesto. Mm -hmm. Revivalist manifesto, which I threw up on the screen, which I will we'll get. And maybe we'll get uh, Mr. McKay on here to talk to us about it. And American Spectator is in solid, was on solid footing, it's sort of reestablished thanks to you and uh, those well, that, you're working was, with. Not just, just me. There's, you know, we've got a whole group it. of great people. It's a, American Spectator for a new generation. I mean, it is kind of funny to think, you know, I got, I used to get all the, all the mag, all the thought magazines, except the nation. I mean, that was too far out for me, but I got mm -hmm. the new Republic, the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. um, obviously I, I got the national review and the American spectator. I got the, the, the bi weekly standard, was, the weekly standard. Right. I mean, that seemed like that was going to be an exciting project for, you know, for a while it turned those people went, you know, completely <laughs> uh, lunatic. Um, now there are all these online magazines. I mean, National Review is, even though many of the authors from NR are people that I follow and who follow me on Twitter mm -hmm. and they're good guys and they, you know, they're important people who write important things, but the magazine is not right. trusted by conservatives, you know, against Trump was a turning point and they kept doubling down and doubling down. And, but this all this American this and American that and the national interest national thinker uh, it is sort of hard to keep track which is fine I mean people you know this stuff is going to shake out it's easier I guess to you know you find a domain name that hasn't been taken you you know there are a lot of young people out there who want to write it's you know easier than it was in the 50s to, to start a magazine I suppose uh but going back to the beginning of our conversation, harder to get something that people are going to want to keep or can mm -hmm. keep because if it's, you know, every, everything is everything is temporary and digital. Mm -hmm. I like your idea of the, um, I mean, there's so much good stuff. I mean, I like I said, reading up, I don't say growing up, I was a teenager when I started reading The, the American Spectator. I guess I was a senior in, in high school. All I was given to me by a teacher in a, in a comparative literature class. Mm. Uh, who saw the flicker in my eyes and said, you might like this. And he gave me a bunch of his old saved paper, American Spectators, but on the old newsprint uh, tabloid format yeah. that they mm -hmm. came in with those uh, woodcut style illustrations. And it was, it was just unbelievable. As you say, like, wow, mm -hmm. people are saying this. Wow. We're, what common sense, you know, and I, I grew up in a working class family. It wasn't the kind of thing that was, you know, that you'd, you'd find next to our Reader's Digest and Ladies Home Journal. Um, so it was, you know, it was transformative. Um, Melissa, thank you so much for coming on. And, uh, you know, for with all this time that we have, as I say, known each other, people on this, who listen to this podcast regularly are a little tired of hearing me talk about that. But what can I do? I'm old. I know a lot of people for a long time. And, you know, as long as I'm still here, I get to catch up with them on Zoom and and, and through the podcast. Uh, you, I, I need to I need to plug something here. Just I was for about a to, I, I, that that was the that was the lead up. More of the same from you, is there something special coming? What I wanted to say for your viewers is, you know, Ron is an attorney, and he he's a very good attorney, and so multiple times in my past career in this business I have called you you have helped me you have if you couldn't help me you find someone who helps me and so it may seem that Ron is playing an attorney on Twitter but he really is one <laughs> and he's a very Thank good very one and, I, and I'm very grateful for all the times that you have um, jumped in and been there when we've needed you I, so I'm well that's very kind of you yeah. Thank you. that's and all I, will, I wanted will, to will, say I appreciate it. And we, um, we're not going to edit that out. That's going to in fact be a highlight and then Harmy Dillon will see it and she'll say, Oh, 
He really, someone thinks he's an attorney. That's good. Um, <laughs> but no, no special projects from you personally, though. You're just going to keep on keeping on doing what you're doing. You plan to stay at, at AppSpec until they. Until they boot me. Well, we're, the thing is, is, you know, we were in turnaround mode for quite a few years. And now we're really building. We've got a phenomenal young managing editor, Hannah Rowan. We have some really good young writer reporters. I think that we, but we also have people who have written, who've been in the conservative space, Bruce Bauer for 40, 50 years, who are phenomenal and can give the people, the younger people who might be watching this an understanding that is deeper and broader. And also, um, you know, the American Spectator was always fun. And we're working yes. to bring kind of that back to that kind of, um, you know, it's never really been lost. If you read Bob Terrell's work every week, you're going to see that he's, you know, uh, goring a lot of the axes of the left pretty much continuously. And he still got it. He has his um, memoirs are coming out this year. He's just finished oh, wow. writing them. They're phenomenal, Ron. You, you as a, you know, reader will love it. And he's telling, he's telling tales because he knows everybody and he's been there. So there's a lot of stories that he'll be telling in there that lots of people will be like, whoa. Um, and so that is what, um, that's what's going on for us right now. For me personally, uh, it's interesting because I started out as writing, right? And so like um, mo most of what I have been focused on has been business. <laughs> You know, the, when I write, it, it's, you know, carving out time to do that. And then I also have a newsletter. So your readers might like that as well um, that you can sign up for. But just come over to the American Spectator. I urge sure. you to do that. There's a lot of competition out there. But I think that we have a, we've got the history and the gravitas and also the fresh new blood too. So I endorse, I endorse that advice. And I think I need to pull more content from American Spectator in my own, into my own feed. Melissa, again, thanks. Great seeing you. And Thank I hope you we can maybe me. do something together soon. All the best. Thank you.